How the f- how do you fuck up a taco in Mexico? You're a gorgeous Whatever. human being is what I do. <laughs> this fucking stallion. Well, this I don't know that the from- cowboy I- that that Paula Cole was mer- mesmerized by. <laughs> Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audio book. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, PK. Hey. Hey, good to see you guys. Good to see you. You can tell who's in Chicago and who's in Austin. You've got your, <laughs> you've got your, your sweater and your, your cap yeah. on. It's 70, and... 75 degrees here. And this is like a nice day in Chicago. It was like 50 something today. We were like, wow, all bundled up. It's so nice out. Okay, let's give this a go. Ashley P.K. Mogazel has worked as a tour manager, production assistant, and done a ton of merch. She's toured with Wilco, The Eels, Postmodern Jukebox, Deer Tick, Nathaniel Rateliff, Man Man, The Colorist, and I'm With Her. Eric Frankhauser is a tour manager. He stored with Wilco, Tweedy, The Eels, Lucinda Williams, Hal Ketchum, Paula Cole, Jimmy Dale Gilmore, James McMurtry, Matraca, nope, Matrasha Berg. Matresa. Matresa Berg. Matresa Berg and Amanda Ghost. And so my first question here is that Ashley is a huge celebrity because of Everyone Hides. And who are you in the video? I, uh, I guess I'm three different people. Are you the one sitting next to him when he goes and sits in the barber's chair? I'm, that is one of me. (laughs) I'm also, uh, I'm next to our manager, Crystal, in the record store. Uh, I'm also in the movie theater when Pat Sansone comes into the movie theater. I'm amongst those people as well. You're like the king hide and seek champion of, <laughs> of the, you're all over the place. <laughs> I am. I think there were a couple of other shots that I was like taken out of because I was already in it too much. And that's just by default from living in Chicago, I think. Yeah. They put like a mustache on you or something. I don't know. <laughs> all right. Uh, so something that's interesting about both of you guys for me, um, so when I toured, which was a while back now, there wasn't a lot of uh, college educated people, actually. So um, at least I brought it up. So I'd get a hard time for being the quote unquote educated one when I was such a moron, which still fits, by the way. But both of you guys actually went to school for this different time periods, I know. So Ashley, you have your um, master's certificate in artist management and a bachelor in entertainment and an event management. So like, what do they teach you? And then I know there's full sale and there's a lot of people that have come on both sides of the, I've, I've heard the good and the bad, like a lot. And I don't know anything about it, to be really honest. But did you find going through the programs was good for you? With Eric, I kind of cheated. I heard you in another podcast and you talked about it. And I think the exposure was really healthy for you is kind of what the take that I took from it, because there was a bunch of people who just wanted to do what you wanted to do. So you could at least hang out with them. And then you had time in the studio to work. Yeah. I mean, in my case, it was a foundation for what I am now. Like I absolutely did not in any way, form or shape, go to school for tour management. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I did go to school for was as just kicking around and needed a reason to get my parents off my back was audio production, you know, studio recording. And that, that set the pedal in motion that became the, the avalanche that is tour management. Yeah. And how, how did you yeah. end up being a tour manager then? Why didn't you stick with sound or whatever else? Because I, I... You like babysitting? The story, the, no, <laughs> no, I don't think a tour manager is babysitting. I know there are babysitters out there and I know that's part of our job. Uh, but if it was only babysitting, I wouldn't do it. 
Um, I love the logistics. I love the planning. I love the fact that I have a strong production background. It can speak, sound, lights, video, audio, trucking, busing. Uh, all that stuff is really fun for me. I love figuring out, hey, we're doing a show on a aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf. You know, that that's the fun part of tour management, right? You know, the, the babysitting and the handholding stuff is there and it's part of it and we're all aware of it. And I definitely uh, facilitate it for my artists. I definitely could be accused of that. There's no question, but- so um, Four o'clock in the morning cheeseburger, you'll do it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's part of it. Do I love it? No, but it's part of it and it's fine. And I've been really fortunate to have artists that don't abuse it. You know, so it makes it easier and it makes it easier too when you have artists that you're, if you're being asked to do something that's sort of outside of the circle of normal, it's almost always because it matters to the show, you know, mm -hmm. and that makes it a lot easier, but that sort of got off on a tangent. Um, uh, it was really simple. I was in Lubbock, Texas, and the uh, options in Lubbock, Texas are pretty minimal. Uh, I was lucky enough to be working for a decent production company, which was pretty rare and weird to be in Lubbock, Texas. And I saw the buses. I was like, I don't want to stay here. I don't want to stay here and sleep in the back of a truck and going from gig to gig um, and just being a systems tech and like slowly moving my way up the chain. And so I just packed everything I had into my 77 Chevy Love pickup truck and moved to Austin and gave it a go. And that's what happened. You know, you had said, so you're from, you're from Atlanta, right? Originally? Um, born in Pennsylvania. Born in Pennsylvania. Yeah, my father. My father was in radio, so I was born in Pennsylvania, then West Virginia, then Atlanta, then Lubbock, Texas, then Austin. So dad would basically rehab radio stations and then he'd sell them or what did he, what was the end? Yeah, he'd sell yeah that was basically it. He'd go in and find the worst performing station in town uh, and then, you know, raise it to number one and sell it and move on to the next, next one. So when it's worst, is it like, uh, so in LA we had pirate radio, which is now like a Christian channel. I, I think, you know, they've, they've switched it up dramatically. Would he change things like that or would it be playing? Oh yeah. Or, yeah. He couldn't care less about format. He's going to go with the most successful format. So he managed rock stations. He managed country stations. Uh, a station he bought in Houston was the original call sign was KGOL. It's for God of love. Uh, he immediately changed the GOL, the God of love to like a top 40 pop thing. Cause that's what was going to sell. That's where he's going to be able to sell advertising and get the, the ratings up. And he had a station in El Paso and he did uh, Tejana rock, you know, but it didn't matter to him. He just knew the market and did what it took. You guys have like Molotov cocktails through the windows and anything like that or. <laughs> no. And I never, we never, by the time we got to Lubbock, Texas, they stopped moving the family. So yeah. when we got to Lubbock, he continued to do what he did, but it was, we were all too old. Changing schools all the time was too much. Um, and so we sort of hunkered down in Lubbock and he continued to buy and sell stations, El Paso, Texas, California. Do you think now that you're a little older and you can reflect back on it? Do you, do you appreciate Lubbock more than you did when you first moved there? I get in trouble every single time. I talk about Lubbock, Texas. Um, <laughs> and uh, my brother, uh, after the last time he heard me talk about it, called me and it, it was a tough conversation. Uh, look, uh, Lubbock was a bad place for me, but at the same time, uh, something like that motivates you. It makes you want to get out. It makes you, I mean, if I hadn't been given the challenges of what Lubbock was, I never would have thrown everything I had in the truck and just thrown all caution to the wind and yeah. started this life that I have now. And on top of that, I have met my wife there and look, my mom still lives there. I have two brothers that still live there. Uh, my wife's family is still there. Um, and after 18, my son's 18, he's graduating this year. Uh, oh. He's been accepted to tech and given a presidential merit scholarship. Um, nice. So after 18 years of me trashing Lubbock to him, I'm now trying to convince him it's a great place because we can afford <laughs> to send him to school there. Does your wife like so. Lubbock? Yeah, my wife is totally fine with Lubbock. She under, she has the same feelings as I do as far as like, hey, I wanted to get out, but she doesn't. I went from Atlanta, Georgia, a massive, you know, cosmopolitan metropolis to a place where there were literally tumbleweeds blowing across the street. Yeah, and you were what, 14? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're at just the time not... where you want to do cool stuff and you're like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, other people in my family thrive. My brother, John, absolutely thrived there. My brother, Sean, absolutely thrived there. So it just is what it is, you know? Cool. And I don't have the animus towards Lubbock that I, I once had. And in fact, I'm very appreciative of the kicking me in the butt to get to where I am. Because I was scared. I told so many people to F off on the way out of town, yeah. uh, Lubbock, <laughs> that I was, you know, scared to death to go back without having been a, a successful whatever I was planning to yeah, do, which I didn't cross know. Cross your T's, dot your I's, make sure there's yeah. like, uh, you can always go back. 
Going yeah, I did not do that. Store there might be a little awkward. I did huh? not do that. I definitely <laughs> flipped off people as I went out of town. There's no doubt about it. So, anyway. And then Ashley, you're from a tiny little town too, huh? I'm from the smallest state. <laughs> are you? I th- oh, yeah, bro, Rhode it? Island. By, oh, okay. I thought you were going to say Chicago. Why are you in Chicago? Oh no, uh, I kind of just ended up in Chicago because I really wanted to leave Rhode Island, and I found an internship an internship uh in Chicago when I finished college that would accept me after graduating from college uh so and they would hire me and I just kind of ended up here who found the in- so did the college assist you in that internship find or that's no. all on you yeah I am um, so I ended up I I had been planning on moving to Rhode Island since I was five <laughs> much like uh eric um i was like i can't live here my whole life and rhode island and providence which is where i kind of ended my time in rhode island phenomenal city i was there this weekend uh for a tour um great place i worked there in a bunch of different places and it's i kind of wish i could go back there but i can't because i i left there in such a way not necessarily like flipping them off you two get along (laughs) maybe like eric did but i i I told so many people i was leaving rhode island to like go do a bigger thing uh and i ended up in chicago for five months which is now almost 11 years uh is that where you you learned to wield your knife or was that from Uh, i got my nickname uh pocket knife uh on the road um my nickname, I didn't really have, my nickname in Chicago was just like Little Ashley because there were like four other Ashleys that were the bar I worked at. Um, and I was like, it can't be known as the littlest Ashley <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it's, I can't do it. And uh, I went on a tour that eventually nicknamed me Pocket Knife, which way I went on a tour. Way worse nicknames, by the way. <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's an okay one. I, I wouldn't complain. I'd be sort of like, Shh, why you've got it be like that's a yeah. good one thanks <laughs> oh yeah i was like can i copyright this also <laughs> uh very shortly after that i met eric and we were on a tour that kind of strictly uses uh nicknames i would say <laughs> and so pocket knife became pk nickname of a nickname uh, and i've been known as that for going on eight years i'd say I'd say people know uh, us as Colonel and Pocket Knife more than they know us as Eric and Ashley. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. But yeah, so I, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I started traveling outside of my state and outside of my city very early on, and knew that I didn't want to stay there. Um, but I did end up going to college there, and I made a number of connections through that not necessarily touring, but I kind of realized I wanted to tour through that. I worked at a radio station, um, which was WBRU. Was this uh, 95 dad, for- Eric? <laughs> uh, no. 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 Okay. Way before I met Eric. Um, this is like the channel that I grew up listening to, 95.5 WBRU. Uh, and I just, I worked with them through working at a Starbucks near Brown University, which oh. is where that radio station was at the time yeah um and then I kind of placed myself near venues in town eventually moved to Chicago for this internship for five months and then worked at a music venue and positioned myself and told a lot of people that I really wanted to tour and I didn't necessarily care how I toured but I would do merch and I would do ticketing I would do whatever it meant but I wanted to experience toy life and you started with merch I started with merch yeah I mean it's kind of like bartending yeah and I still do merch for friends for friends and for you know tour family if they need a person I don't what's funny is I had a, a lady by the name of Kelly Kelso on here and she's she was awesome she was really entertaining and it came up randomly, but it was the stuff that people leave in tip jars. <laughs> and so she had this nutty list of things. Did you find that too when you were doing merch? Did you guys have a tip jar? 
And did they oh, put I, like crazy stuff? I got home on Monday from a tour that I, so I've been, Eric and I have been on tour since what, Eric, July. Yeah. And I left him in August. Um, no, sorry, I left him in Austin in October and flew to another tour where I was doing strictly merch for a friend uh, and for a band from Rhode Island. Um, and I was doing merch and we had a tip jar and it's the tip jar that like they've had for three generations of merch people. Oh boy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we regularly get weird things in tip jars. We also get like, this is strictly for the band or like, you know, buy yourself a beer or, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's just whatever. Yeah. But I also, I like to keep weird things in there so that I can also give them something back. Like, so what, oh, did you, what are examples? Like what weird stuff do you give or what did you get? Like random stickers or I had this, I found this like corner cutter. I'd be like, oh, you bought a sticker. Can I cut the corners for you? And just like <laughs> kind of like rounded the corners of things. And it's something that I found randomly, but drunk yeah, people at merch tables, they love it. Ah, cool. Yeah. yeah, she got like cocaine bag. <laughs> oh, I did get a couple of joints <laughs> in <laughs> cities where it was legal. Um, and weirdly, uh, this one time somebody gave me a couple of joints. I got a text message from another friend from a different city who was like, hey, a friend of mine said that he left a band that you work for joints at the merch table. It's a nice little small world situation. Have you looked up Eric Frankhauser on YouTube? Oh God. So there, a couple this, guy, this guy looks like God. <laughs> I don't know if you were like the Envision God. This guy, he is the largest, he's a bodybuilder with the biggest calves in bodybuilding. Yeah, I know who you're talking about, the wrestler, <laughs> but he doesn't spell my name the same way. He spells it with an AU, I think. Oh, so yeah, totally different. <laughs> so I thought you were gonna bring up some some like YouTube footage from eels and puddles and stuff like that. So no, I didn't do the dive. I should have done a deeper dive. No, it's I was okay. It's there. On Ashley it's, in the videos. It's it's there. If anyone can find it. It's uh, just it's a uh, absurdist farcist theater. So you know, take it with a grain of salt when you find it. I'll find it. Uh, interview with Paula Cole. That was interesting to me because uh, you were excited. You flew across country because she wanted to interview you. Um, I didn't know that was ever a thing, you know, with the upper management, is that normal that the artists will fly you to places to talk to you? No. I mean, now it's probably changed. Cause we could probably zoom it. I, I don't know, but. I, it's the only artist who ever interviewed me directly ever and oh. all, all the years she's the only one. And it was super exciting. Right. Because it's like, Hey, he has a manager in Hollywood. Oh my God. She has a number one record. Oh my God. I'm getting asked to go do this. And uh how cool is that they're gonna like fly me first class up to new york i'm gonna interview her. i'm gonna fly home the same day that seemed very rock you know at my in 19 you know 1999 or whenever eight whenever that was uh it seemed like the coolest thing in the world but yeah no that was very unusual i mean um i've never been hired i've never interviewed the artist with the artist directly except in the bollicle stuff I've always been asking, by just like you know are, you're from lubbock are you a real cowboy and you're like yes <laughs> <laughs> i don't think she knew my backstory i think she just uh so uh paul's manager was a, a legendary uh person named john carter who went by the name carter if you see the tina turner documentary he's the one that you know basically brought tina back to life um and uh he had also managed eels and he and I had gotten the Eels gig through him. I think you probably heard that story by voicemail. Uh, he hired me by voicemail. Or actually, yeah, that's not crazy. even not even voicemail. It was a cassette recording machine to tell you how like you know how old and how long ago that was. Um, but I had a great relationship with Eels and with Carter. And that that tour, all those tours went really well. And then he has this other artist that needs a tour manager. Eels are off album cycle. She's on album cycle. He's like, hey, you go be her tour manager. So he already wanted it to happen. And she was just like, well, wait, you're just telling me it's going to be this person. I need to meet this person. So, you guys did and I wasn't Wilco gig because Wilco tours a lot. So, I mean, you, you can basically, I don't know. You can basically just keep them on, on and you keep touring for a while. I don't think they're going to stop. They're cruising. Yeah, so. no, I mean, look in a perfect world, uh, you know, whenever I'm done, Wilco is done. You know what I mean? Like I, if it went like that for me, uh, 
I have such affection for all six of the guys in the band and what we refer to as Will Crew. Um, people throw the word around family in this business, and it makes me want to throttle them because I I hate that because I yeah. because it's a one it's a one way street family, and I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah. But I think we have I think we have something special with the current makeup of Will Crew, uh, and you know I, those those guys would walk through a wall for me, and I'd walk through a wall for them. And Ashley is well. I mean I, I'm. I mean, PK and I have been together since 2008. No, 14. 14. 13? It's 13. only 2013. 13. 2013. Eight ish years. Yeah, we've been together for a while. Yeah, yeah 2013. And, uh, you know, 2013. And, you know, I certainly, you know, we PK and I've had our moments. There's no doubt about it. We're going to have more to come. But uh, I certainly yeah. can't imagine, like, uh, you know, I, Anytime she's offered a TM gig, I'm going to be her number one, you know, reference and fan and doing whatever I can to make sure she gets it in her own right, because she's absolutely that talented. But at this, then I'll be really sad, because I think we're like the greatest one two punch in rock and roll. Well, you can always keep together. I mean, the Rolling Stones, you know, they'll pay you both really good. You'd be fine. <laughs> I don't know how long they'll keep touring, but she did tell me she's not a fan of R.E.M. I told you that. <laughs> Maybe not, but I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get him to tell me the story that I thought was kind of amusing. I don't know. Oh, I know that story. I, oh, the I story. Like I've heard it enough that I could tell it myself. And PK can probably tell. A fun twist, actually. You have the other person <laughs> tell the guy's story that he always tells. That there would you be go. funny. She knows all my stories. She all she knows. She of knows course, all of them. She's, she's, she's like heard them years together. Yeah, she knows everything. <laughs> she knows all of them. So. Yeah, we're close to ten years. I, there's a couple of them I could. I could almost tell every time that uh, that Colonel Air talks about him and his wife. It's kind of like a an ongoing joke that he met his wife when I was born. <laughs> oh, she <laughs> like to be like in 1988. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, but no. Yeah. It's in the, in the small world thing. I I grew up across the street from Peter Buck uh you know guitars for rem and uh there was no connection in any way form or shape rem wasn't rem at all he hadn't even gone to athens yet at that point he lived in a suburb of atlanta called roswell so and then just you know 25 whatever years later uh ran into each other at eels gig um and i said hey by the way and he remembered and we started remembering and there's you know started laughing about it and uh, he remembered me riding my bicycle into his car and his dad being really mad about it and him letting me off the hook and, you know, all kinds of good stuff. I grew up across the street from Angelo from Fishbone. And oh, wow. yeah, I, I was riding my uh, skateboard down the street and I ran into his mailbox and I fucked myself up. Right? <laughs> and I remember his mom just like put me back together, you know, and I just remember him looking like that was stupid. And I'm looking back at him like, shut up, Angelo. <laughs> so... Yeah, the, the kitty shenanigans but i think inadvertently even if you guys have a separation in age and stuff you know you 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 would go out and get the records when they came out maybe initially i'm guessing but it was kind of like i had a connection with this guy and then you listen to the music a little more which could like develop into other music so with fishbone that's what happened with me i i started to look into like who they liked and who they worked with and then i was like wow this guy's cool you know and it just kept building into why all of us listen to music is that little rat race of fun and finding all the different things. So then again, with you and your father, I mean, was your whole house filled with records and stuff? Cause your dad, or was it just straight business? Uh, my dad was a pretty straight up guy, but you know, like Peter remembers, like I, I was too young. I didn't get any of the cool tickets, but my older brother and sister did. Um, my father did a thing called the champagne jam uh, in Atlanta. Uh, if you remember the band, uh, Atlanta rhythm section, they had a big hit with a song called champagne jam, sure. uh, and the old Fulton County stadium, which doesn't exist anymore. And I want to say one year was like sticks in Boston. And so it was that era. You're talking 78 or nine or seven, somewhere in there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but the big deal with me is I got to ride the helicopter. My mom made sure I got to ride the helicopter from the airport into the stadium. Um, cool. and I, and I was on with either Boston or Sticks or somebody, and I had no idea. I was just excited about the helicopter ride. I flew into the stadium and I flew out, and and you know that was that was pretty cool. Uh, I think it was me and my brother Sean, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah, super neat. So as we're yeah. getting older, instead of running to our problems, can we like can we kind of like jog? Is that okay with you, or or is there still this running thing? It has to be like 
I think we're, I think you have to run to your problems. It's, I it's still another, run. I'm getting, so, I'm like lagging a bit these days though. <laughs> it's another, for better or worse, kernelism that PK has heard a couple thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So when I first was going to put this uh, podcast together, I was at my friend's house. My friends now have little kids and uh, most of them at least. And his daughter's in fifth grade. And she uh, said that I should ask every person who comes on the podcast when they first felt famous. So if we don't want to go down the road of fame, that's totally cool. But when was there a moment in your career that you would choose as being a catalyst to push you forward within what you do or just something that made you feel good? What's a moment you each would choose about what you do? Oh, Go first, man. BK. Off the cuff, and I don't, I don't know if it's because I was just in Providence that made me think of this, but um, my first thought, I was working for WBRU, uh, and I was in, I'm five foot nothing, very tiny, um, but for some reason they put me in charge of driving their WBRU, like, completely labeled van. Uh, and I had to drive that down to Lupo's in Providence, which is on a major street, in which parallel Lupo's? park it. The, not the original, but the second, which okay. is on, it's at the Strand. It's like, I think it's on Westminster Street. And park it in the, like, front and center downtown Providence, which, you know, Providence by default is very tiny streets, parking a giant Yukon, GMC Yukon. Yeah. being you know my size is not expected um and there's one night in particular that I parallel parked this giant GMC Yukon parallel parked it had to jump out of the driver's seat because it's so high off the ground and like in a mini skirt walked over to like the whole production team of Lupo's and they were just like Hey, <laughs> not bad. That's and cool. uh, one of them eventually ended up like because of that night, we started talking and he taught me how to focus like climb and then focus lights. Oh. And that is the direct reason that I learned how the stage was set up, as in like downstage, upstage, stage left, stage right, whatever. Um, and that was my. Under, that's the only reason I knew that was because of that night that conversation and for me being in Rhode Island and being somebody that like always wanted to work at Lupo's I just like parked this giant truck there one day um I felt pretty famous after that and a couple of them I like run into on the road now and they still remember me which is really nice but I feel pretty famous because of that <laughs> and I think about it all the time I go back I like to Rhode it. Island yeah, I love cool. it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's super awesome. I like that one. <clears throat> uh, I guess for me, uh, there's a couple things uh, as far as what propels me and keeps me going. But if in the first, the kind of the first things would be like my first bus tour, like that was just like, I'm getting on this tour bus. I'm doing something nobody does. Like nobody in my world has done this. I created this world life for myself solely through work and effort and i'm doing you know like i'm a tour manager on a bus tour like that was a big deal you know yeah. um and it happened luckily for me fairly early uh and then i did a million van tours after that uh but that moment was like wow that's that's pretty cool and like going we actually had a gig in lubbock texas with one of the artists and like you know just casually bringing my parents and my family onto the tour bus go yeah this you know this is what i do you know, this amazing thing here, like, oh yeah. And then we're going to be in another city tomorrow night, do this all again. Cause I'm awesome. <laughs> you know, uh, just being able to go that when you spend so much time telling everyone to get bent on your way out of town to like ride in heroically, uh, is a pretty cool moment. Uh, and that was a long time ago. Um, and then, you know, the first time you see your name, like on an album or credits, or you're thanked by somebody, that's just that just blows your mind it's just like wow I, you know it's like even if you had the most infinitesimally small part in it um and then the third thing which pk hears me say all the time is you know the three greatest world words in the world are house lights out and it's the you know calling house lights out and the roar of the crowd is the drug it's the addiction it's the it's what gets you going every day even after a really really bad day or just when you've had it with your artist i've had artists where i was ready to go home that night and then they go on stage and they burn it down you're like okay one more time yeah one more time yeah you know so 
Uh, yeah. What are some of the uh, what some of the more entertaining gigs that you've had? So what I mean are like the venues where you've kind of been like, we're gonna fucking play in this shithole tonight. You know, like is this like where do we even put the gear? I mean, what do we do? Do you have any fun ones from the bands that you guys have worked with? Oh, I mean, a million, uh, you know, I think <laughs> King Tut's Wawa Hut in, uh, in Scotland, in Glasgow, uh, is probably one of the all time great, amazing, you know, dive places to play. Um, Sounds awesome. And it, it's, it was amazing. I don't even know if it's still there, but I was with Eels. It was my first Eels tour. Uh, we were in Europe and those guys were huge. And in fact, that's another moment. Uh, we were on French TV at some point with eels and uh, we left. It was the first time that we had to run into a van and peel out. Cause there were girls screaming and chasing, you know, the vehicle down the street. It's like, this is pretty cool. You know, this is awesome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'd say King Tess Wawa hut for sure. And, uh, you know, trying to get this band that was, should have been playing, you know, a place much, much bigger, but it had been booked before they blew up um, stuff like that. Uh, the, polar opposite that are places that are iconic and great at the same time which is not always true right um but radio city music hall cool. albert hall cool. those places are like these are check marks that you know are really really important the apollo in uh you know new york or um a sold out show at hollywood bowl or you know those are the yeah, things barbara that bowl the, the roseland yeah. uh the war so field. many yeah but then you take the other Beach side is beautiful and, yeah you take the other side of it though places that are quote unquote dies are small but that you love like the cat's cradle you know in north carolina or i'm um, struggling to think of another one maybe the troubadour in, in la or uh, just because it's small and divey doesn't mean it sucks and just because it's the biggest most important venue of all time doesn't mean it's great i could care less if i ever do a, another show at carnegie hall again and i don't care if they hear that in fact i'd love for them to hear that you know doing <laughs> doing a show at carnegie is an absolute nightmare it's miserable um so i don't know what about you pk well i think um you know 9 30 club comes to mind first i was just there a couple of weeks ago and i was there on a co-headlining bill that was close to selling out and yet we still were there on a friday night and therefore it's a disco loadout and there's nothing you can do about it and so we had a show that is regularly a late night show co-headlining two headlining bands that are have their equal amounts of of patrons coming and yet we saw to clear everyone out by 10 30 oh. um <laughs> in order to make room for this late night dance party but you know what it's 9 30 and it's 9 30 after a pandemic and you get all the swag you want <laughs> and it's you know it's 9 30 you can't say that enough yeah. you've got production managers like Ed Stack and and Gus who yeah you know they're fucking legends and yeah, the night before absolutely. that or you know a week before that we were with um we were with Conrad at First Avenue it's another venue where like it's First Avenue <laughs> doesn't matter yeah. uh, it's the- fucking First Avenue and it's phenomenal yeah absolutely and there's a connection there that I think of at those venues too. Every single place you just mentioned has iconic, great people at it. Yeah. I, mm-hmm. I would do anything in the world for Conrad. I do anything in the world for Ed or Gus or, yeah, you know, absolutely. those, you know, those are people that are just, uh, you can't sing their praises enough. And it's interesting, not just like 930 being iconic, of its own or red rocks being iconic of its own it's the people you know it's the people i i would add that like you asked when is the time that eric or i both felt famous and for me like eric and i have been out since july the end of july right and um we had three long great but long months of Wilco, and then i did this additional month with a band called deer tick Mm -hmm. who are great friends and the tour managers my best friend and it's a fun tour but to go to a venue like first avenue where conrad is essentially wilco family right colonel like yeah, absolutely 100%. Conrad, and he knows me as like oh my god it's it's pk and the and the uh talent buyer james he knows me as pk with wilco 
and going through and we have already seen it was the who buyer sorry oh uh james the the talent buyer for uh first stab james baker uh he knows me as pk with wilco and we went through we already saw james or sorry we already saw eric or ed with 9 30 we already saw him this month or this year um and to go back through a venue of his as PK with Wilco, but with a different band, that is like, I feel very famous. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing here those emails come through and be stay. like, wow, PK, it's great to see you again. I already saw you last month. It's like, what, yeah, you know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> speaking of Ed and speaking of iconic moments, uh, the uh, <clears throat> probably the biggest Ed Stack iconic famous moment because my phone blew up so much the next day because people knew and pk was there for this was oh. steve perry steve perry singing for the first time on stage in 25 years oh i saw um, the video yeah and you know we were both there for that and that was a cool moment and my phone absolutely exploded i mean cnn and you know every major news network somehow got my number and was you know was calling and that was a really cool moment you know i mean putting walking him to stage and he, he was an amazing guy, but he was nervous. And it felt great that PK and I are the ones that provided that safety, social, happy bubble to keep him from thinking about what he was doing for the first time in a long time and getting him on stage. I mean, that's pretty cool. And he crushed it. He crushed it. Totally yeah. crushed it. He kicked butt, yeah. man. Yeah. I mean, that also kind of harkens to like mine and Eric's like, meeting story of like, yes it does people, it does people, <laughs> i uh i got the job through a mutual friend of ours i didn't know him didn't really know of the eels and i just was like yeah cool i'll fly to la and he picked me up at burbank and on the way to uh to rehearsals he was like okay sure. so steve perry's there um he needs you to you know make sure your phone's away or whatever when you're inside the room and i was like i don't I don't know who this dude is. Steve Perry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever. It's like Journey? I'm like, oh, yeah, I've heard of Journey. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, this is where we're at. <laughs> yeah. I'd say that that's pretty indicative of our relationship, Colonel. <laughs> yeah. Well, my favorite part about this us meeting story is something I didn't find out till later. You told me, I don't know, either later that tour or years later was uh, she flew into Burbank. Burbank's only like five minutes from Third Encore. So I ran over to get her and picked her up. Um, and she didn't know me from Adam, you know, uh, the person that had recommended her knew me and she knew the person obviously that recommended her. Uh, but I pick her up and, you know, if you look at me on, if you just look at me, I'm a big guy with long hair and You're a gorgeous whatever. human being is what I do, <laughs> this fucking stallion. Well, this I don't know that the her, cowboy I, that that Paula Cole was mesmerized by. <laughs> I do not think that is the case. Uh, but uh, um, it turned out that uh, like she was texting with her mom the whole time because her mom was like, "I don't know about this guy. Make sure you're safe." Like, <laughs> so you know, like I picked her up. She's like, "I'm here." Like, you know, there was a. I think there were code words involved. I don't know, PK. You'd have to fill it in. Oh yeah, my mom and I are both avid uh, viewers of like forensic files and csi and law and order so we absolutely googled eric Frankhauser before before i flew to uh, los angeles to meet him I, I mean i don't think it's a stupid thing to do at all i am why oh, not definitely not no I but at the time uh his facebook picture did you, was did like, you find the bodybuilder guy <laughs> your mom was like hmm, no look at those cows <laughs> no, no. uh eric had um like longer curlier dyed black hair uh he looked very intimidating in his picture oh <laughs> um in his in his facebook picture at the time so my mom was a little concerned all is well she's a she comes out to wilco shows all the time does she now she gives you a hug you get a bear hug actually oh, she probably not yeah. this, the covid stuff but anyway in general <laughs> she considers this to be um like dues paid for her so she gets to come out to shows all the time she should She's, too yeah oh for sure yeah she brought yeah. me out to, to concerts since i was two years old and she loves to tell the stories about it good yeah i think i think of her as i you know i think we would call her mama knife so you know she's she's yeah. always welcome backstage and, and around she's great she's fantastic 
Do you guys but, have any uh, like show shenanigans, uh, wind ups, any kind of like st- stunts you pull on the other acts or anything from the tours that you guys would remember? I mean, I, I hate that stuff. So that doesn't happen a lot. But I think the biggest shenanigan PK and I were part of was me getting hired by Wilco. Yeah, probably. I would, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, I was, we were on tour with Eels. Yeah. And um, I had been playing phone tag and interview tag with uh, Wilco management you know i just correct i have to correct myself i have to correct myself i i I said no one else interviewed me but jeff absolutely did and it's a key component of the story i don't know why i blanked on it um but we were in chicago at the vic with eels and e the lead singer had just sent me over the edge i don't even know about what um and he and i are really good friends it's fine if he hears this um uh, but I don't know what it was, you know, it was at that point in the tour, we we're just on each other's nerves. You know, the TM artist relationship at times can get fraught with just, you're just too close, too close to the fire. Uh, and it was just one of those moments. It didn't even last, but I was really angry and I had given up on the Wilco gig. Cause I just hadn't heard back from management. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to give them one more call. And I gave, uh, Wilco management a call, a guy named Ben Levin, who worked for Tony Margarita at the time. And he was the day-to-day guy. Um, just said, Hey, I'm in Chicago. If there's any, you know, you know, I haven't heard back from y'all, uh, but I'm here. If you want to talk, if not, I get it. You probably hired somebody else and, you know, thanks for the opportunity. Got a call back uh, like 10 minutes later saying, Hey, Jeff's at the loft in Chicago, the Wilco loft. And, uh, if you can get over there, he'd like to, he'd like to talk to you. And so PK, <laughs> I pulled her aside and I was like, Hey, I'm taking the runner to go interview for another job. <laughs> And uh, she covered for me. I don't think I don't. I don't know if he, he even knows the story. So if he hears it, this, may be the first time he knows. <laughs> but uh, that I got hired by Wilco, and I only made the call because he made me mad. So yeah, and it was definitely a thing where like I should not have been the one in charge <laughs> during that. That was my first bus tour. Like I'd never been. I had been to the Vic because I lived here and hung out with the house guys. But like I'd never been on tour at a place as large as the Vic. Um, I was essentially. Uh, the production assistant and the merch person so I was just like you know I guess I'll just like hang out in the office and Eric was like taking my blazer going to the loft it's good you did though <laughs> you got a oh, good gig out of I mean god yeah, yeah. we both did yeah I think it was by the end of that by the end of that eels tour you had found out you were going to be moving on to the yeah. logo stuff and, and I remember know. asking if you wanted to come along you're like yep yeah. So, I was like, yeah. Did uh yeah. are you still you still have stage fright, PK, or no? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I hate being on stage. Um, I do, you know, I've got my the things that I do on stage, um, like setting out waters and towels and, and you'll do that during the show, you don't care? Will you kind of like run out and then get the hell off the stage because you're like, ah <laughs> Oh, I don't do it on during the show, no. But no. during changeover, you know, our Will crew guys like their brothers then sisters of mine it's really great to you know go around and and Eric Colonel comes out and we kind of check the stage and I'll go out and put the waters and towels down and now that I've gone out with other artists and tour managed my own I've Mm. had to actually run out during shows and move things or prop up certain things or unplug things and I'm like I don't know what this is um (laughs) and so I've I've had to kind of get over parts of um stage fright but i i if you had to call me out to give a speech i, oh. I would not be able to do that that's a little yeah. different i know that's a little different but like you know toweling up something or grabbing a hat or whatever is a i don't know that maybe you can overcome but i mean like barbara strice hands which i might be total random pull but she's still deathly afraid of being on the stage you know which is amazing to me. It's your whole career, it's your whole life. But I guess it is. I've had a lot of, you know? I, uh, Wilco definitely doesn't suffer from stage fright, um, but they don't suffer from arrogance either. You know, they want to bring yeah. it every night. But I've had um, definitely, definitely artists, well known, iconic artists who are scared to death to walk onto the stage. It's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. then it, like something clicks, you know, with a lot of them at least, where you're kind of like, what the hell were you worried about, dude? I mean, that was sick. There, there was a magical three song tipping point with one of my artists. How's mm-hmm. the night going to go? If we can get this particular artist through three songs and get a thumbs up, we're going to have a great night. If not, 
everyone buckle in, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's not, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. So it just depended, you know, it just depends. But um, I mean, we're not, when I say hijinks, I, I don't want to make it sound like we're the most boring tour ever. <laughs> I think we have a great time once the truck doors are closed. I think uh, we have a great time on nights off, days off, you know, non-show days. Um, and I think we have fun during the shows and we all, you know, there's a, yeah. you know, there's a tradition for a long time during the Nels Klein solo for the stage, right. To do a shot during the solo. It was the oh. impossible Germ the impossible Germany shot and all that stuff is harmless and yeah. totally fine. There was a point where one of our techs didn't have a whole lot to do. And he put together, you know, like a charcuterie tray and brought it over to the guys <laughs> on stage, <laughs> but nothing ever. Like, it's a pretty important to me that you don't mess with the performance. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't have fun. Uh, I mean, we did stuff in my early days before I realized what the ramifications of it were when I was young and not ready for prime time, like yeah. covering the uh, opening acts drums in uh, talcum powder. Um, with, <laughs> so they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. And he sits down to play and, you know, <laughs> you know, all over the place. But it messed with the performance. And I learned very quickly that that wasn't kosher. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, okay. So. What band was the talcum powder one? That was Eels opening for Luscious Jackson. So you said oh, Novocaine. Weird. Eels had the big hit, a Novocaine for the Soul, but they're opening for Luscious Jackson. And um, we covered, I want to say, I forget her name now. Uh, she played with the Beasties um, oh. boys before Luscious Jackson. But yeah, we put talcum powder on the drums. Yeah, the talcum powder one. I've heard that before, but it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, all right. Um, if you guys have any other stories, you're welcome to share them. But otherwise, thank you. I appreciate it. I don't know, Colonel. Right. Do you have anything else? I mean, so such a treasure trove. <laughs> we, ha I mean, we have a lot of stories. Well, I can pick, I you know, like know. So I'm with her is a, is a big stepping stone with you, PK, right? And like you sound really excited about it, but um, oh yeah, it uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity for me. Um, well, they're not exactly was... a tiny band either, so I mean, you're kind of like getting your. I'm gonna say first hurrah. I hope I'm not wrong. But with like a I mean, really big act, like they're good. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my first official tour managing job, but it was my first like uh, bus and trailer um, tour managing job that lasted two years. Uh, yeah. And it came pretty perfectly at the, um, the, the you know, Wilco is going on a hiatus, uh, which was an unknown quantity at the point for, for Colonel and I. We kind of wasn't, we weren't too sure what, was going to happen for that and what that meant for the crew mm -hmm. um and they're a phenomenal band and they're very loyal to their crew but we also just we didn't know it could have been a year it could have been six months it could have been three years um and ben levin who eric mentioned earlier uh has gone out on his own he has his uh, own uh, management company now manages an artist named uh Aoife O'Donovan who is one third of I'm with her. And so he put me in the ringer for tour managing I'm with her, which was meant to be a few months turned into two years. We had two infants at the start of uh, I'm with her, which I don't have any kids. I'm not, I don't have any younger siblings. I'm not usually around children. Uh, so we had two babies uh, that towards the end of the tour were two toddlers. <laughs> Is coochie After coochie coo years. still a thing? <laughs> it no, it isn't. They're oh, no good. pretty awesome rock and roll babies. Yeah. Nice. We taught them how to use the, the walkie talkies, the you know, the radios. That's um, cool. They were a lot of fun, uh, but it was something that I I didn't know anything about and had to like add to my knowledge of also being a tour manager. So. Baby handler. <laughs> yeah i also have to like acknowledge the fact that i have two moms and two toddlers uh as well as a bus and a crew and torment uh, a, a tour bus driver and a trailer and all these other things um but it was a lot of fun um it was a lot of work and it was definitely a learning curve and i yeah. had a blast doing it and i'm still very close with my band and crew from that uh, and i look forward to seeing the now tiny humans that were infants when I first met them which like I said I'm not usually around children so that is a very cool very cool thing to see yeah. that and I would I would just say that one of the coolest moments for me and I want to say it was hardly strictly bluegrass 
during the hiatus, Jeff toured a lot. So I was busy with Jeff solo stuff, uh, Jeff solo tours. Um, and we rolled into Harley Strictly and to see PK there as a tour manager of an act was one of the cooler things yeah. because she literally, I hired her and right before we got off the phone, she goes, by the way, I've never been on a bus tour, but I'm a small and I can fit in any bunk. <laughs> <laughs> and to go from like that and picking her up at the airport and, you know, like knowing that, you know, just from where we went to see, to see that was just awesome and amazing. You know, What's and the best I tell her all the time, I tell her all the time that, you know, when you're on an arena tour and you come through my town that she better give me a laminate uh, and not give me some sticky pass. It doesn't get me anywhere I need to go because uh, uh, she's going to keep on skyrocketing. And uh, but just and that's fine. But I get a laminate no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> the number one thing I've learned. <laughs> Colonel gets a laminate if he ever comes to visit me on tour. <laughs> Good call. What's uh, what's the best bunk? Are you bottom row or middle row? Tour manager bunk is the best bunk, which I think that by yeah. by law, the tour manager bunk is uh, front, middle, driver's side. Yeah. And yeah. for me, that comes all the way back uh, to the days where there were basically intercom phones in one bunk, right? One bunk had an intercom phone to the driver, and it was always that front, middle, driver's side uh, bus. Because when I started, there were no such thing as condo bunks. No one had thought about changing it out. It was just three bunks per side, no matter what. So, um, <clears throat> so I think that's the best bunk. But the first bus I had, I remember they had little windows in each bunk, so we could watch out the window and see stuff go by. And I was, I loved it, man. You're watching America as you're driving through. And then we got, I think it was ACDC's brand new Prevo, right? And all the drawers were filled with candy. <laughs> and I was like, okay, it's a sacrifice that I lost the window. Like all oh, this wonderful candy, and they were like the big chocolate bars and stuff. I was like, ACDC is the best band ever. <laughs> it is always hilarious when you get a a bus that was custom built for some band. Uh, I'll never forget getting on like Motley Crue's bus, and it was just glass everywhere. It was like mirrored glass every <laughs> surface possible. It's like this is not a good idea. It's not safe, you know. Uh, I don't know how much cocaine residue is left on here. Uh, a lot. good for like a lot, good lot. for them. Yeah, a lot lot. And fair <laughs> enough, you know, like and uh <clears throat> but you know, whenever you get a somebody else's bus, it's clearly for someone that's not, you know, like I did a lot of Texas singer songwriters, right? A lot. You know, ever do Nancy career. Griffith? I toured with Nancy. I so um I love Nancy uh, Griffith. That's my like little her cool. tour manager was an amazing James McMurtry is actually really cool too. I don't want to forget that. Well, that's awesome. James James was formative uh for me in, in many ways. Um he was the bridge between uh the small, small, I hate to say because Jimmy Dill Gilmore wasn't small, he was on Electra Records, right? <clears throat> but he was he was, I think, what you would sort of think of as a a trophy artist because he was real quality and he was amazing, uh, but he was never going to sell. I mean, Electra also had Molly Crew and he was never going to sell 20 million records, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so those opportunities were amazing. James was amazing, but James was opening for Nancy. Um, oh. And Nancy's TM at that time was a guy named Nine Year Woolridge, who just who taught me a lot about like how to like stay calm, which I have to fight every day uh, and learn to do that, learn that lesson every day. Uh, but yeah, she was great and they were great. and. Um, yeah. And you know, you're not I, ready for, I had time. heard, uh, one of the guys who came on here, he told me it was actually Jim Rungi, And he said that she was a hard person to deal with and stuff. And I was like, not my Nancy. You know, I was like, what the hell, Jim? But, uh, he said she was, a, she was a bit <laughs> tough. And I, uh, well, I remember any of that? I mean, you weren't the tour manager for her, but I, I think there's a, I think there's a real dividing line there. I think there's three categories. I think there's bad people. Then there's people who are demanding and then there's people who are dealing with an insecurity. Yeah. Um, and I think it falls into those three categories. There are some people who just want to make you jump through hoops just because they're assholes. Yeah. Uh, my career, I've been very, very lucky. I don't have many of those in my career. Um, and even the ones that I butted heads with the most 90, like I said, 99% of the time for me, it was in service of the show. And then the third category is I absolutely had people who were scared and I'm not, I'm not going to name names of who is what and who isn't. Um, uh, I'm just not that guy, but uh, <clears throat> I didn't, Nancy was demanding, but I wouldn't say she was, she was tough, but mm -hmm. I, so I was a formative TM 
Um, and I would say like in the Paula Cole era of my life, which was only three years, it was a rocket ship up and a rocket ship down. Like it was this parabola of way up here and then boom, that song. Play. I mean, how many records that one album sold? Mm. It's gotta be crazy. And, I mean, uh, let's see. If you look in the back of my wall, that's the double platinum. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so uh, my ego wall. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, it's I wasn't so large. <laughs> I was not ready for prime time. I was not ready to be an arena tour manager. And you learn on the job, you know. And uh, I haven't touched. I haven't stayed in contact with Paul. It's been twenty plus years. Uh, but you know, I'd almost be interested to sit down and say, like, you know, my self critique of myself during that time is not you know i wouldn't have hired myself well you, you grow up you know you change you yeah. develop and i don't know i mean it, it's impossible to look back to reflect upon who you were you know 20 years ago hopefully you're different <laughs> it's a long time yeah yeah <laughs> so it was a dividing line for me about how i toured i came off the road after that because i was so burnt out but i had spent i had spent five years of 10 or 11 months on the road straight with you know just constant i was afraid to say no and you know pk yeah. did you ever have that feeling like you're scared to say no because we don't know when this life is going to end um uh, and so i didn't yeah, I didn't say yeah bit. yeah i didn't say no to anything so there's a five-year period where i was gone for literally 10 or 11 months uh, famous story of you know me my wife picking up and moving our entire house to a new place and i didn't even know it um you know she i was coming through town on tour and i was like hey i'm gonna have time to stop by and she's like great i'll fax you a map of where we live um you know so i after those years i came home i came off the road for a little bit and that's when jim rungi took over for me on eels oh he did oh no i knew that i knew that i knew that yeah yeah jim was fun out here i gave him a hard time for sure because he had a record shop in the beginning and he just was sucked <laughs> he said he would just get the cool albums he didn't care what people really wanted so I'm like, so you're like the worst business owner ever. And he was like, it didn't go good. <laughs> so it was Jim's a hard worker though, man. He called up out of the blue. He was a he was my LD on Jimmy Dill Gilmore in 1994. Oh. <laughs> and he got that gig by just calling managers who he thought had artists going out on tour. And he worked for a, a company and he's like, Hey, I've got this older gear that my boss is gonna let me take out for next to nothing. And you know, I want to come out on tour with you. And that's you know, that's how we met, and that's how that all happened. And we've been, guy. he's successful too man he's had an incredible yeah. career he's killing it so it's, it's awesome yeah. and we and we flipped you know we've traded artists quite a bit like i handed him eels and he covered hell catch em dates for me uh and then i took over lucinda from him when black keys happened for him and so you know it's a small world up there well, as brothers in arms it's the, it's what you need to everybody working yeah. together to make it happen i guess is so what was james mcmurtry was he the one who toured with jerry jeff walker for a long time no, it was Hell Catch Him tour with Jerry. I mean, uh, so it's very possible that that uh, James toured with Jerry Jeff, but not in my time frame. Uh, but uh, Hal Ketchum in his early years when he was like, you know, winning the songwriter contest at, uh, at Kerrville Folk Fest and stuff was out opening for Jerry a lot when Jerry flew his own plane, that, that Navajo twin engine, like from gig to gig. And it was just like, you know, Jerry, a guitar player, and then like the solo acoustic opening act. And that was how that was way before my, that was my, before my time is. Well, I'd have to look it up. And I, I, it's a, uh, the guy like basically he's, he, he does Mr. Bojangles, but he just speaks it. And it's, it's awesome. And he, he, he was his opener for all, for a bunch of years. And he, he talks about the story of how the song came about and stuff. And it's just, it's really, really cool. But uh, I'll look it up and I'll send it to you. It's it's cool. I don't, I like a lot of the Texas type folk music like a lot. So the James the James stuff was interesting. I saw so much. You know, he was on Columbia. He was on a big time label. Yeah. And um, we were you know asked to come. We were in New York. We we're playing Tramps, and uh, his deal was up, and we were, was about to get renewed. Or and they're like, hey, come over to Sony. So you know, we go to Sony. Their their lobbies on the. 80th floor you know or one of those deals like sky lobby thing and we're ushered into kid leo's office kid leo's the the a r guy at the time he's got you know rings on every finger and he's like hey look at my view up the window of central park you know and it's like yeah, you know, yeah. he's here's this famous iconic person already in rock and roll right just absolutely you know uh just known for everything uh and uh, we have a great time he's like really like, talking to james it was great we raid the cd closet uh, and then we go to tramps and we find out like two hours later, they dropped them. Yeah. 
you know, it was like, so those, those, those are the things you learn on the road and stuff like with, and you're there with the artist at a tough moment. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Awkward. Well, I mean, I guess you bite yeah. your ears and you lick your wounds. I mean, what, what do you do? Have you ever heard right. of a guy I had him on the other night? He's a, was in a band called spirit. His name is Al Haley. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, spirit must have some stories because of their fights with Zeppelin, you know, so. He was interesting. He, uh, you know, and, and the reason I brought him up was because uh, he was talking about Steve Perry and Steve Perry was like singing backup vocals for him before journey, you know, <laughs> type thing. And it was like, wow, that's pretty neat. And then uh, he had a few that he wrote a song uh, for uh, Keith moon. And then he ended up playing on half of the Keith moon solo record. Yeah, wow. which was just a shit show. I guess it's like ranked as one of the worst solo records in history. I haven't had time to listen to the whole thing, but now I want to because they said how bad it was. But they said like the only track that's listenable is the one that Al wrote. So I was like, go Al. There you go. That's so, very cool. It was cool. It was really neat. Yeah. Anyhow. Anyway. <laughs> well, guys, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, yeah. thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to take a touch if you guys are in LA. I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> we'll be in. I'll uh, be there. We'll be- <laughs> I'll actually yeah. be there at the same time as you, Colonel. Are you? For You're going to be there purposes. same time? Yeah. Yeah. I, Jeff yeah. has solo shows at the Largo that he does every few years, like Woodshed's new stuff, or does, you know, just plays these shows for fun. Um, hmm. And uh, so we'll be out there uh, at the end of the month, at the end of December, early. Yeah. yeah. Hit me up if I'm around. I'll meet up with you guys. We do lunch or something. Yeah, man. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Cool. I'm just, I'm yeah. just there because my, my close group of uh, female, friends that are also production people the knives uh, the knives the yes. knives yeah um, we have you need our... to do that you should forget this podcast just get all them on at once i'll bring them on we... if i don't see you in la pk i'll see you in mexico oh yeah i'll see you in mexico yeah, yeah and mexico is sky... anybody well mexico is sky blue sky festival which is wilco's festival in at the riviera the hard rock riviera oh, okay um and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's basically four days and it's amazing lineup. It's sold out this year. Uh, and we're working, there's no doubt we're working, but it's the most fun environment to work in possible. You know, like you're in Cancun in the winter time and you've got, there's nothing but A-list bands everywhere you turn in A-list people. And it's just a great environment. And it's a beautiful, wonderful, fun thing. Yeah. And you get great tacos. We well, do get great tacos. <laughs> we only get great tacos because of PK there pk pk uh ref, i think she threw uh or threw out or refused the, at least the first three attempts at tacos by the hard rock cafe until they got it right <laughs> oh man how the how do you fuck up a taco in mexico i mean when, well i i can't answer that i don't really make tacos i do eat a lot of them though <laughs> i'll just tell you she didn't she didn't fucking accept it like you know she's like no this is our festival. We're in Mexico. Whatever this bullshit fucking corporate chafing trade taco shit is, get it the fuck <laughs> out of here. <laughs> <my crew. laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. She's like, she, she's the reason for that. So uh, different verbiage, but yeah, very similar. I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what Colonel heard in the office. Oh, cool. That uh, was what kind of bullshit tacos are these? We're in Mexico. Uh, but the email was much more on point than that <laughs> all right guys well that was super fun right. i appreciate it have a great time in la have a fantastic time in mexico and uh thank you keep rocking <laughs> yeah cool think Thanks of a good outdoor time. think of a good outdoor place joel our covid protocols require we meet outside but uh, I'll meet uh yeah that's fine with me somewhere. and uh let me yeah let me know i uh when it gets closer to the time be like hey you know dick hey we're in it we're coming to la i'll be like all right <laughs> Yeah. all right i got it i got a jet my family's staring at me because i made them be quiet for an hour and 15 minutes so uh you're an oh yeah that time's up you're a dictator yeah. <laughs> all right. thank you though tell them we, actually tell them we all appreciate it thanks <laughs> will do my son does refer to us as dictators which i think means we're doing a great job i think you're doing a fantastic job hi dad <laughs> yeah <laughs> see y'all take care all right, guys Bye. Bye. thanks y'all see you pk you Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, 
Don't be a dick.